Hello everyone, welcome to yet another session of the NPTEL course The History of English Language and Literature. Today's lecture is in continuation with the previous lecture where we, be, where we began to identify and locate the various influences during the transition period which signaled a transition from the Augustan and the age of Johnson towards the Romantic age of the 19th century. We noted how a certain kind of a foundation was being laid by the publication of the work The Castle of Otranto and also a renewed interest in Middle Ages or in medieval history which followed in the coming uh, years and uh, of course which lasted through the century and even went into the uh, next century, the 19th century. If we look at the works of some of the uh, writers of the, latter uh, of the later period of the 18th century, we begin to notice that many of these writers began to anticipate the arrival of the Romantic age of the 19th century. And some of those writers, though they did not contribute directly to the, uh, to the uh, spread of Romanticism, their works were quite instrumental in showing how a transition had become quite necessary to not just react against the tenets of the Augustan school, uh, but also to uh, indicate the shift towards a new kind of uh, literary tendency. So, some of the major writers of uh, this uh, period of the later half of the 18th century include Richard Hurt, Bishop Percy, Thomas Chatterton about whom we had noticed even in uh, one of the earlier sessions, William Collins and James Macpherson. And all of these writers, Heard, Percy, Chatterton, Collins and Macpherson, they were also part of the age of Johnson when we talk about literary periodization. But however, if we talk about uh, the, uh, the dominant tendencies of their work, we can also see that they could be uh, classified as among the forerunners of the Romantic age. There were also the set of writers, mainly Thomas Gray, Robert Burns and William Cooper, about whom we shall take a closer look at in uh, one of the later sessions. And these three writers, uh, uh, it is very difficult to classify them either as uh, 18th century writers uh, or as uh, uh, 19th century romantic writers because in their works we see more of uh, the transition elements, the dominant element of romanticism getting uh, manifested. Uh, in that sense, these three writers, Gray, Burns and Cooper can also be uh, treated as among the earlier romantic uh, writers. When we talk about romanticism in the 18th century, we also need to have a proper understanding of what constituted romanticism in the 18th century. Of course, this is a term and a topic that we shall come back to again look at uh, to look at in detail in the 19th century. Uh, but however, at this stage, we need to have a preliminary understanding of the term in order to get more conceptual clarity about this age of transition. In the previous lecture, we noticed that there was a tendency to react against everything Augustine. In that sense, uh, loosely one can say that uh, the romantic could uh, uh, come to define everything that is anti-Augustine. Uh, but however, uh, when we look at this term in a closer detail, in a more analytical, literary critical way, it just does not uh, suffice. It is not just about everything that is anti-Augustine, it is perhaps a little more than that. And one of the dominant tendencies of this uh, period is a continuation of the growing interest in the medieval or gothic revival, something that we began to notice even from the publication of the Castle of Otranto uh, onwards. And, and when we talk about the major tenets of the romantic traits of uh, the later 18th century, uh, it is useful to, it's useful to uh, identify a few major elements. The first major influence and the first major tenet of this uh, period was uh, spontaneity in literature and this uh, could be read in uh, a tandem with uh, that of the assertion of individuality which was uh, also getting reflected in the spirit of the uh, politics of those times. And one of the major things of uh, this uh, display of spontaneity was a certain way in which writers were trying to go against the conventions of any proper literary school or proper literary criticism. In that sense, there was also rejection of the critical code and the rules of art. In fact, it was even felt that poetic genius itself should be a law unto itself because there was no room for any other external uh, force. Uh, dictating a particular kind of a law or a code of conduct when it came to this, uh, uh, when it came to this expression of true genius. Perhaps in the continuation with that, Victor Hugo, one of the influential writers of those times who influenced all of Europe, he uh, he opined that this was an age which inaugurated liberalism in literature. So we begin to see that writings of those these times were freer from the. Uh, dominant political, social, uh, social-cultural influences. Uh, more than that, there was a uh, 
uh, a certain stamp of individuality in everything that was getting artistically expressed. All of these expressions were also characterized by strong passion, sensibility, aspiration and aspects of melancholy. Accordingly, many writers and thinkers and critics of those appear, uh, these period, they also felt that it was the renaissance of wonder and mystery. So, we see that whatever was lost and forgotten in the medieval ages were uh, being brought back in the later 18th century and also more significantly in the 19th century. And this also resulted in, a, in the love of the wild, the fantastic, the abnormal and the supernatural. And this newfound love was manifested not just in the writings of those times, but also in the general passion and interest of the common people of England. And accordingly, as a result of all of these uh, things together, we find that even the general public had a fondness for fred, fresh subject matter. They also appreciated individual genius much more than any other kind of uh, literary or artistic uh, lineage. And there was also a growing taste for the marvelous, which uh, uh, which uh, find uh, which finds its culmination in the 19th century. Perhaps one of the foundational influences of the later half of the 18th century is that of Richard Hurd. He more than the more than the artistic or the poetic writings of uh, Hurd. What was more influential was his Letters on Chivalry and Romance, published in 1762. And in this, he uh, celebrated the Gothic manners, and he argued that the Gothic element provided a far better material for poetry than classical mythology. Uh, we also need to understand that this was uh, this was around the same time when Castle of Otranto was uh, had grown immensely popular not just in England but also in different parts of Europe. So uh, the arguments of her did go very well with the uh, with the common reading public of those times. So one of his uh, 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 one of his arguments included: May there not be something in the Gothic romance particularly suitable to the views of a genius and the ends of poetry? the poet's world is all marvelous and extraordinary. So, here we find that Hurd was making it possible for infusing even poetry with the gothic and the supernatural elements and it need not be re restricted to the aspects of uh, prose romance or prose fiction. And uh, in that sense, his work significantly helped to connect the medieval revival with the general movement of reaction against the Augustan tradition. So we also find that not just in the, uh, not just in terms of uh, the treatment of subject matter, but even in the matters of poetic rendition, there's a way in which the medieval aspects play a significant role in moving against the dominant tenets of the Augustan tradition. Another influential figure was uh, Bishop Percy and his most important work was published in 1765. It was a ballad book titled Relics of Ancient English Poetry followed by the subtitle consisting of old heroic songs other pieces of our earlier poetry together with some few of a later date. This long and winding title does talk about the contents of this uh, work as well. So, this was as the title implies it was a collection of many years and the works of many authors put together and it was also uh, it, it also needs to be seen in continuation with the ballad revival which was becoming popular in the latter half of the 18th century. And this publication instantly was also suggested by Shenstone and this work was uh, immensely influential in uh, spreading the romantic taste of those times and if you remember this ballad revival was also one of the ways in which the common public as well as the writers were trying to react against the, uh, uh, the dry intellectuality and the uh, ornamental expressions of the Augustan tradition. So, this work was particularly influential in the intellectual development of Scott which we shall uh, take a look at at a later point. It is also said that this uh, work led to the immediate inspiration of uh, Beatty's work uh, Minstrel. And, um, like many other works of these times, this work was also immensely popular. It uh, was uh, much in demand. It ran into many editions as well. The other important figure is that of Thomas, is that of Thomas Chatterton, about whom we uh, had taken a look at even earlier. He was uh, considered as a marvelous boy who uh, commits uh, suicide at the age of eighteen, and uh, even before this, uh, in spite of this very short period of time he had left a tremendous mark in English uh, literary history. And uh, he was uh, one who had a fascinating interest in medieval history and we also noticed that even at a later, uh, even at an earlier point that his uh, uh, claim to fame was his supposed discovery of a certain 
Thomas Rowley, a poet whom Chatterton claimed was a mythical Bristol priest of the 15th century. But however, many critics had different opinions about this and some even uh, dismissed this entire claim saying that uh, it was uh, completely uh, connived and it was uh, completely um, forged out of the imaginations of uh, young Thomas Chatterton. But however, he did fascinate the, uh, the imaginations of um, However, he was found immensely fascinating by uh, many of his contemporaries including uh, major, uh, major later writers such as uh, William Wordsworth and uh, this also and at least for a brief time he even successfully uh, uh, led even critics such as Walpole into believing that uh, characters such as Thomas Rowley did exist. This continues to be a matter of dispute but however, the common interest in anything regarding the medieval ages or medieval history uh, was uh, quite uh, significant that people were willing to buy anything out of curiosity when it came to uh, uh, a discussion about the middle ages. So, this uh, growing curiosity of not just the critics but also the public for uh, listening to something about the uh, about the middle ages it does talk a lot about this transition uh, this age of transition. Uh, Chatterton, uh, has, uh, Chatterton himself wrote just a couple of works such as uh, Ayla and a Ballad of Charity. Uh, his poetical works however are considered of a supreme quality given that he was uh, very young his work was still uh, maturing and that many feel that he did uh, he did have the potential and the uh, and, and, and genius to uh, turn into a better poet had he lived a longer uh, had he lived for longer years. And this uh, interest in this historical interest in the medieval times was uh, quite significant in the sense that it was not just about the poetry which was getting produced in the 18th century, but people were willing to consume even the forgotten writers or the lost writers of the medieval history even if it was even if it was brought to them in certain spurious uh, forms such as Chatterton had uh, did. So, this is more important not just in terms of the work itself, but in laying a foundation to the growing interest in the medieval history which would again uh, come back to uh, come back to us as a major influence in the 19th century. So, during this period we find that there is a further spread of interest in the romantic past and also this uh, in, in some form or the other we find that this interest spreads out of the island of England, it uh, spreads uh, further north and also there is a growing interest in the heroic and legendary world of the north and accordingly we find the English people as well as the Scottish people are uh, all of a sudden turning to the world of Celtic antiquity thereby uh, renewing this interest in the medieval ages and taking it to another level altogether. So, it is in this uh, uh, context that we need to look at the work of William Collins who published his uh, uh, The Ode on the Popular Superstitions of the Highlands of Scotland considered as a subject of poetry in 1788 and this work was originally written in 1749, but given the kind of uh, increasing interest and the curiosity and the historical curiosity that critics and the public had on such a theme we find him we find Collins publishing it enthusiastically at later point in 1788. This work had a very broad significance not just in the history of England, but also in the history literary history of Scotland and he also had published a set of uh, other lyrical odes which were not uh, commented well by most of the critics, but nevertheless his uh, work uh, in multiple ways it tried to connect this medieval in the, the growing medieval interest in uh, within uh, England with that the, with that of the growing uh, interest in other parts such as Scotland and Ireland. So, it is in this context again we try to understand the work of James uh, Macpherson who was a young Scotch uh, schoolmaster. And his most important work was fragments of ancient poetry collected in the highlands of Scotland and translated from the Gaelic or Erse language. And in this work he tries not to publish original work, but he tries to compile major works which were lost or forgotten from the ancient Gaelic um, history. So, this was also celebrated as the genuine remains of ancient Scottish poetry and in this uh, context let me also uh, recall your attention to the, uh, the elements of Scottish enlightenment that we had discussed and this is also an opportune time to uh, remember that there is a way in which the English literary history and Scottish literary history uh, remains intertwined in these respects.
So, uh, following the success of his Fragments of Ancient Poetry, we find uh, Macpherson setting off on a literary pilgrimage in quest of a fresh material. This was also with the understanding that there is always a possibility of uh, identifying or discovering uh, lost works from the medieval times. So, maybe this was uh, it was the same kind of curiosity that had inspired uh, young Chatterton as well. Understanding this from the Scottish point of view, this also had another nationalist appeal because there was a way in which the uh, the uh, Scottish writers were also trying to uh, identify their own lost history and keep it at par with the, that of the British history. So, according, accordingly as a result of this uh, pilgrimage that uh, Macpherson undertakes, he also identifies a number of other works which he publishes as Fingal, an epic poem in six books in 1762, followed by Temora with eight books in 1763. So, there is a dispute about many of these works, many uh, critics also feel that uh, Macpherson had heavily mediated the earlier writings and some even feel that he himself had manipulated many of these works to fit in uh, with the kind of interest that was growing in uh, London and in Edinburgh. But nevertheless, this uh, work was hugely successful and was received with much enthusiasm both in Edinburgh as well as in London. And this growing public interest also led to the popularization of this, uh, um, the, the mythical creation which resulted from Macpherson's works. The mythical creation which uh, resulted from the popularization of uh, Macpherson's works, namely the legend of Ocean. A set of poems, the Oceanic poems, were uh, used as a, a rubric term to talk about the uh, most of the works which Macpherson successfully compiled together from the medieval uh, ages. And uh, Macpherson uh, uh, began to assert that all of these uh, poems that he had uh, uh, compiled and he had collected after his uh, pilgrimage throughout uh, Scotland. He as began to assert that these poems were the actual work of the Ga of a Gaelic third uh, century bard named Ossian, and this also uh, led to a lot of uh, literary and social controversy. And there were supporters who uh, who were convinced that uh, Ossian did exist and that. Macpherson had successfully unearthed all these uh, forgotten poems. There were also denouncers who felt that Macpherson was uh, going a little overboard and trying to fool the uh, critics as well as the uh, public given that there was a growing interest in the medieval times. So, the admirers of these oceanic poems included Napoleon and Diderot and Voltaire uh, even wrote parodies about uh, the oceanic poems which also led to its immense popularity across Europe. Thomas Jefferson believed that uh, Ossian, uh, though we do not know whether he was a real figure or a mythical figure, Jefferson nevertheless believed that he was the greatest poet that has ever existed. And uh, many other critics also believe that Ossian was the Celtic equivalent of Homer. So, as we mentioned earlier, there was a nationalist element also built into it. Uh, in a way, the people were willing to buy this argument. Uh, provided it would give them some kind of a superiority uh, in in, uh, in 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 whole of Europe in terms of the uh, literary myths or the literary legends. This collection of poems, uh, later known as the Oceanic poems, were also greatly praised by Walter Scott. We also noticed that Scott was generally quite lavish and extravagant uh, with his uh, praise of her literary works. However, there were also people on the other side um, such as Samuel Johnson who found this as a gross and impudent forgery. He was never willing to, uh, he was never, uh, willing to be convinced by the arguments of any of the critics and he was quite convinced that uh, a poet such as Ossian did not exist and it was all a figment of imagination and a very manipulative creation of uh, Macpherson. This dispute is uh, yet not definitely settled, but however, what uh, sustains our interest is that a wave of oceanic enthusiasm swept over Europe. In revolutionary France, boys and girls still bore the names of Ossian's heroes and heroines. It is in this way that the historian Hudson records the popularity of uh, Macpherson's uh, uh, oceanic poems. And the uh, popularity and the immense influence of uh, Macpherson's uh, work could be understood from uh, the single fact that this, uh, these poems were translated in the 18th century and in the 19th century into different European languages such as German, French, Spanish, Danish, Italian and Polish. So, across Europe there was a growing interest in these kind of works and in, uh, in, in, this, uh, in, in the light of this uh, uh, immense popularity, the, the disputes even, uh, even the disputes were quite overshadowed.
what made these works immensely popular apart from the historical curiosity about them was the element of wild romanticism built into them it also had a lot of supernatural elements so there is always the suspicion that uh, uh, macpherson in a certain way was trying to play to the gallery and 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 had deliberately included most of these elements which would uh, continue to interest the people even in the 18th century uh, the work in terms of its uh, subject matter and treatment it was steeped in melancholy it was also sentimental in this nature uh, so for a 3rd century poet to write uh, in a way that would uh, that would uh, uh, influence the 18th century readers it, it was a quite a feat which is why perhaps the suspicions about the uh, historical veracity of uh, ocean also exists in terms of the uh, poetic form or the uh, a form of uh, writing also it was uh, quite an exact uh, fit because we find that even the oceanic uh, poems they uh, it, it rejected the uh, classical couplet and it also celebrated a freer form of verse so all of these uh, elements uh, uh, put together it continued to raise the suspicions against the veracity of uh, uh, macpherson's work but nevertheless it's uh, uh, nevertheless its popularity could not be contained or cannot be disputed at all and more than everything what these uh, this set of oceanic poems did was it in many ways cemented this call to return to nature and it in that sense uh, celebrated a world of heroic simplicity it brought back uh, to it brought back to discussion the elements of nature such as mountains and mists and also reiterated this call to return to nature as we begin to wrap up this uh, lecture it's uh, useful to again remember that the circulating libraries which had become extremely popular by the end of the 18th century also ensured that all of these works had wide currency and that it was getting read by a wider public than ever though books continued to be expensive in some form or the other uh, these circulating libraries ensured that almost everyone had equal access respective of class and gender to reading material so these are some of the um, the advertisements which were uh, which were put up uh, even as early as 18th century about the uh, relevance and the popularity of the circulating uh, libraries and this uh, fact almost made a printing and the dissemination of reading material quite a natural fact and no longer a spectacle in the 19th century so uh, just as books have become uh, almost quite a, a common item in today's uh, world from the beginning of the 19th century onwards we find this transition happening and from this time onwards we no longer draw attention to the difficulties of uh, getting a book or the difficulties of uh, accessing reading material but it becomes part and parcel of the cultural ethos of england and we do find that the common people they take a huge advantage from this a uh, growing fact and also it becomes easier for the writers also to get across and communicate to the readers in multiple ways so in the 19th century as a result of this we also see a growing population of uh, critics alongside there's also growth of literary criticism uh, which also uh, reiterates the fact that uh, 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 any kind of literature can grow only with the help of sustained and informed uh, literary criticism so uh, with this uh, we uh, begin to wind up today's lecture and in the next lecture we shall come back to again look at some of the other foundational influences which paved the way towards the romantic age of the 19th century and we continue to also remember that this was also in terms of uh, periodization the age of johnson and after this we shall be moving to the age of wordsworth or the age of uh, uh, romanticism and we also begin to notice that from this time onwards from the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century we also moved to a very different level of understanding of literature altogether and also that from this point of time onwards what dominates the discussions in literary history is uh, mostly of literary events and we find lesser and lesser of non literary events except when uh, it, it it is of a supreme uh, relevance or importance so on this note it's time for us to wind up today's lecture thank you for listening and look forward to seeing you in the next session